Okay, everybody heard that? That's it. So as I was saying, so here we are now focusing on Abraham and uh, what follows from uh, um, Abraham being singled out by God, Abraham and uh, Sarai, Abram, as his name is called at the beginning of the story. And uh, the, the, the beginning is like out of the blue with no explanations. Um, Abraham is, is, is Abraham and, and Sarah are introduced to us at the very end of last week's Torah portion that they uh, are married um, and uh, they uh, travel with Abraham's father, Terach, up to Haran, and that's as far as they go. Um, and uh, the uh, um, information we also have from before is that Sarah, or Sarai, as she is called at, at the beginning, uh, is barren. She has not had any children. So then out of the, the, the blue, God says to Abraham, get moving. I'll tell you where to go. And of course, that's all very famous. And he goes, he lands up in the land of Canaan. He doesn't stay there apparently very long. There's a, a famine. And Abraham and Sarah go down to Egypt. They last there for a while. They finally come back from Egypt and return to the land of Canaan. And uh, again and again, God promises to Abram and Sarah that uh, um, that this land, this land is your land. That this is really the land. That uh, this is this is the special place. Um, there's uh, another fellow traveler, so to speak. Um, that. Uh, so why is this chiming if nobody's telling me what's going on here? Um, there's a fellow traveler besides Abraham and Sarah. Um, and that is, anybody remember who that is? Lot. Lot. Lot is Abraham's nephew, his uh, brother's son. And um, just to make sure, I think that's the brother. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, Haran dies, Lot's father dies, and Abraham becomes the, the kind of surrogate father. You know, the, he adopts um, Lot, and Lot follows along with Abraham. And then we have the uh, uh, clash. Uh, Lot grows up and becomes prosperous. And Lot's shepherds and Abraham's shepherds don't get along. And Abraham doesn't want to have a family fight. So he says, let's just split up. It's better for both of us. Whatever you do, just choose whatever you want, and I'll go the other way. And this brings us to the introduction that will later on become very, very important. But here it has its own uh, little focus. Lot chooses to live in the city of anybody else but Alan? In the city of Sodom, ah. so so bum 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 bum, right? So uh, and the Torah doesn't get you know stay uh, you know subtle. It says and Sodom was a terrible place, right? And yet uh, Abraham's nephew Lot chooses to to live there. Uh, this sets us up for a little side uh, um, story of uh, uh, regional. Uh, battles and politics of different uh, 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 petty uh, monarchs that are uh, allying with each other and they have a war among themselves. And guess what? The king of Sodom and of course the entire city of Sodom is taken captive by their enemies. And when Abraham hears that, he goes out and he goes with uh, his own militia and uh, defeats the powerful forces of these other kings and frees um, Lot. And uh, there's a little encounter with the king of Sodom. He doesn't want to have anything to do with him because he knows that the king of Sodom is evil. So there's this kind of like hovering uh, question about participating in an evil society. What, what does that mean? And, and uh, how does how does how does uh, how do how do we make choices when we can make choices um, in that regard? 
um, we have a very interesting encounter between Abraham after that battle and Malkitzedek, who is a priest to the high God, apparently a monotheistic uh, uh, believer also. So Abraham is not alone in that. And then finally we get, um, not finally, then we get God's covenant with Abraham, uh, the Brit Ben Habitarim, the covenant between the cut up pieces. Very strange, strange uh, text. And then finally we have the, uh, the last uh, section starting with chapter 16. We've had a lot of, we've had a lot of chapters already. Um, 16 and going into 17 is uh, the playing out of the fact that Abraham and Sarah still don't have kids. So what's going to happen? And Sarah takes matters into her own hands and she uh, foists her maidservant onto Abraham, Hagar, uh, an Egyptian maidservant. Um, and Hagar has uh, conceives and then a lot of trouble begins. So, uh, and then at the very, very end of the Torah portion, uh, God commands Abraham and the entire household to adopt the mitzvah of Brit Milah, the covenant of circumcising all the males. And uh, that's where we basically uh, end. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff in the Torah portion. So as usual, I ask, uh, does anybody uh, want to uh, choose a particular uh, uh, segment of this to, uh, I don't know what that, oh, I see what that is. Oh, got it. Okay, um, to focus on, what do, what do people say? I'm interested in the living in an evil place. All right. Well, guess what? You are. Living in an evil place. Yes. So, uh, so yes. That's, that's, that's the interest. That's it. So that we finished. I know. Yes. I'm, I'm just giving you a hard time. So let's look at that actually from, from uh, um, I mean, it's not like the Torah, you know, goes through a whole essay, you know, unpacking the problem. The problem just keeps on, uh, on you know, rolling out more and more. I see. Yeah. As we, as we go through the stories, um, we could even actually um, go backwards a little bit. Let's 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 use that as our lens through which to read some of the story. Okay. okay. So let's start on page seventy-two, and um, this is chapter twelve, verse ten. So Audrey, you got it? Yes. Okay, so how about you do us the honors? It was your idea. Sure. There was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was severe in the land. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. If the Egyptians see you and think, she is his wife, they will kill me and let you live. Please say that you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you and that I may remain alive thanks to you. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw how very beautiful the woman was. Pharaoh's courtiers saw her and praised her to Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's palace. And because of her, it went well with Abram. He acquired sheep, oxen, asses, male and female slaves, she asses, and camels. Okay, so let's stop uh, at this point, that pause. And let's take in, this is of course a notorious story in other years in, in, in uh, Torah study. Um, this has sometimes come up as a kind of a proverbial um, problem that Abraham, again, still he's still called Abram at this point, that Abraham doesn't act uh, well, and that this is a terrible thing that he's done, because he basically, um, at least the perception is, he gives up his his wife to be uh, uh, abducted and, you know, taken uh, by whoever, 
um, in order to save his own skin. That's the perception that a lot of people have. Um, and uh, I'm not uh, you know, going to argue with that, but let's just read what's going on. So first of all, the Torah story opens by telling us there was a famine in the land, right? And then Abram, blah, 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 for the famine was severe in the land. That's that first verse, right? So in the Hebrew, ra'av ba'aretz, blah, 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 ki kaved ha'ra'av ba'aretz. So it starts with ra'av ba'aretz and then it ends with ra'av ba'aretz. So as a literary question, we could simply say, why doesn't it simply say, and there was a very severe famine in the land, and then so Abram went down to Egypt. So, and uh, any suggestions about why, why the Torah goes in circles a little bit? So I would suggest because it's a little bit of, of, of trying to indicate Abraham's uh, reluctance. Abraham doesn't want to leave. And there's a famine in the land and he doesn't want to leave until the famine becomes unbearable. He wants to hold on. He wants to still stick it out. He wants to uh, um, you know, make the best of it. After all, he has in the previous uh, verses, we, we see he's had meetings with God. He's had visions of God in this land. He seems to have finally made it. And uh, the land has been promised to his descendants. So he knows there is home. And yet, this is the, 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 the terrible irony here. Pretty much as soon as he puts down a little bit of, of roots and starts feeling comfortable, it, it gets unbearable to live there. So the way I'm reading it is, so this famine starts and Abraham and Sarah try to hold on and hold on, but they can't eventually, it breaks them and they have to leave. So they have to go down to Egypt where there is no famine. So they start going. And then we get verse 11, where he says, verse 11 and verse 12 and verse 13, this is their, his, his speech as they're going down to Egypt. What do we make of this speech? Well, it, it, it strikes me as um, um, an act of panic and cowardice. I mean, I'm afraid, sorry to say it, but it, it does. Verse 11, chapter 12. <clears throat> as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, sorry, I know what a beautiful woman you are, etc. You got it? Alan, you, that's, you got the place? Yeah. Good. So this is the famous, the famous place where he says, tell, lie. Tell them you're my sister. Where's God? Where's God in all this? No, Good God question. told him to go, and I'll show you where to go. But, and God hasn't yet said, boom, this is it. You know, you've, you, you've reached payday, you know, whatever the, what's the monopoly thing, you know, and, and that's it. Yeah, you got to pass go. Right. So, so but, but there's an implication, right? Before that, God says... I'm going to give your children, verse 7, I'm going to give your children this country. This is this, this, this land. So like I said, when I was trying to like go very fast, there's a, there's a pretty clear indication that this is the land that God will show you, right? God doesn't tell Abraham at the beginning, doesn't say go to the land of Canaan, and they somehow they get there. And then this, uh, you know, God, appears, God says, okay, your children are going to get this land. Seems a pretty clear implication that this is the destination. And then there's a famine and they have to leave and nobody is telling them to leave. God doesn't appear. So I'm taking your question. I'm trying to keep it focused only on this particular choice that they're making. We could, we could, you know, apply your question earlier too, but we're not. Okay. With your uh, permission. But here, right. There is no, at this moment, it doesn't say, and God made a famine happen in the land, and God told Abraham, okay, go down to Egypt to save yourself or something like that. No, these are uh, decisions that they're making without apparently divine explicit direction. And now what Audrey was saying is, and now Abraham is panicking out. 
And with, you know, if we add your question to it, there's a good, there's a good reason to panic out. Where is God when I need him? Where, where is God now? So that's one side of it. Mm -hmm. But the other side of it is, is that where does he think he's going? What, it, what is making him panic out? The famine. What? He's, he's panicking because there's nothing to eat and the, the famine is very it's very difficult. Okay, no, but what is he saying specifically in, the, in his speech? He's saying that uh, he's saying I'm really worried that about they're gonna take you. that they're going to take you and they're going to murder me. So, okay, let's go back to that lens that we that we decided to adopt for this uh, for this reading. What he's basically saying is there may be food in Egypt, but this is one rotten society. We will not be treated well. We are going to have to lie and cheat and steal to be able to survive at all in this foreign territory. Because these Egyptians are just going to take advantage of us like crazy, and they're not going to even bat an eye. If they think that they want you, they'll take you and kill me. All right, so before we, you know, we, we get into the, the you, know, you know, was this the best strategy and what, and how could you lie and all that kind of stuff, we have to sort of a little bit back up and understand Abraham and by extension, of course, Sarah has no words to say here, uh, which is, you know, always, uh, you know, something to notice from a feminist perspective. She's not given a lot to say now, um, but we can still extrapolate. This is a conversation they're, they're having together. And Abraham is saying, we've been forced to leave. We don't know if we're doing the right thing or not. We don't know what the heck we, we can do other than this. It's, a, it's, it's the best of terrible choices. But now I'm freaking out because maybe this is not gonna save our lives. Maybe, maybe you, know, you are a beautiful woman and you're gonna be abducted and they're gonna wanna get me out of the way. So, so uh, what are we gonna do about that? So before we get into the stratagem, I just want to, you know, again, what he's saying is we're entering an evil society and we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. I wanna, in terms of our own modern uh, situations and the news and, and everything that we're aware of, you know, we, we like to think about, um, people coming into our country as people who have this, uh, um, and, and then, you know, if you, if you like them, you say it in a more positive way. And if you don't like them, you say it in a real negative way. But, you know, we're this wonderful golden in Medina. We're this wonderful golden land. And we've got all, of, you know, all the good stuff here. We've got the food, we've got the shelter, we've got the gold in the streets. And these people want to come here and take it. So if you have compassion and, 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 and favorable attitude toward them, you go, look, here are people who share the American dream, right? They wanna, they wanna participate in this wonderful, uh, um, you know, country of freedom of opportunity. If you hate them or you're afraid of them, you go, oh, they wanna take advantage, they wanna take it away from us. But either way, America, the United States, our society, is really great. But the truth of the matter is, is that even if people are running away from fear of being murdered or fear of being starving to death and they're coming to the United States, yes, there's a lot of you know, stuff, there are resources in the United States, but it's a mixed bag. Some people do have a dream that they think that this country is gonna be wonderful for them but others have no illusions and they're gonna, you know, we're gonna have to escape those border guards. We're gonna have to, you know, lie low. We're gonna have to somehow scramble, but it, you know, we can scramble in the United States better than we're gonna be able to scramble in Nicaragua or in, uh, or in Guatemala or in Mexico or, or wherever uh, where you're. And, and the same goes for all of the refugees in, in Europe. It's not necessarily that they think that Europe is some wonderful, terrific country. They just think it's better than, than sure death in, in their own country. 
And what Abraham is saying here is he's being in one, in one sense, um, you know, he's assessing where they're going and he's going, we're going into a land that has no morality. It has food, but we may, we may uh, uh, get into a lot of trouble. So what does he think is gonna happen? Let's unpack a little bit what he thinks is gonna happen. Well, that they'll take her as a slave probably and kill him. Well, and when we say a slave, that's, that's all, you know, that hard work and everything, but she'll be raped. She'll, mm -hmm. be, she'll be sexually abused because she's beautiful. Um, so they're gonna, they're gonna take her and they will kill me unless they say, unless, unless we say that I'm your brother. Why is that gonna make any difference? That is, I have no idea. Well, because then she could be bought. Then she'll not be stolen. She could be bought. Yeah, you, you, you black. You, you you froze out for a second, so we missed the beginning of what you said. Start again. Because then she, she, if if it's if it's a wife, then it's you know you got to kill the guy. If it's a brother, then you could buy the woman. So there you go. So the the he's an um, he it depending on who, what stat status he has, he will either be an obstacle in their way, or they'll be able to deal with him. So Abraham is saying a very ugly thing. He says, "Look, I can't do anything to save you. They're gonna if they decide that they want you, they're gonna want you. They're gonna take you. The only question is, are they gonna take you?" without killing me or are they going to take you by killing me if they if you say to them he's my brother so he does, he's not looking at me as as a sexual object he's not looking at me as as he's not going to be competition to you uh for for uh for for my uh, uh sexual favors so if you say i'm your i'm your brother then they'll leave me alone or they'll Give me, uh, you know, they'll, they'll buy you because I'm the boss, right? This is a patriarchal society. But if you say I am your husband, then it's not they're going to go, oh, you're, 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 so you're a married woman. Okay, forget it. Excuse us. Sorry. They will simply kill me. So Sarah's abduction and rape is in Abraham's mind a sure inevitable. thing. It's inevitable, right. That's what the only the only question is: Is there going to be murder involved also, or not? Is this the only place he could have gone? So that's the that's a, four points on a compass. There are four points on a compass. First of all, he's a little bit down south. He's a little bit more in the Negev. Right. Um, that's I think first of all right, um, and um, apparently, as we will see again and again and again. Oh, he, he couldn't. He can't go east because that. Yeah, because where Lot is. Well, he can't go east where that is Lotus, or the way that the famine, you know, geologically or geographically is set up, you know, the same thing happens with, with Jacob's sons, right? right? It seems that Egypt. But the difference there is that they say in Egypt there's food. Here they don't say that there's food in Egypt. Well, apparently there is. So, and what's the difference? The difference is that Egypt doesn't depend on rain. Right, Egypt. Egypt just has a Nile. The Nile. The Nile flows forever. The Nile is a god, um, and and uh, you know the Nile irrigates. They they you know are, they irrigate their fields. They they bring canals of water into their fields. In in the land of Israel, Canaan, if there's no rain, there's no there's no, no there's no crops. So uh, you know. So you're right. It doesn't say anything about. It, doesn't give you all of the explanation. But what we see again and again. In the biblical stories, when Isaac has to run away because of a famine, he thinks about going to Egypt. And God says, you don't have to go quite that far, just go to Gaza, right? So, and, and why? Because Gaza, well, they'll, it's by the water, there'll be uh, merchandise there, who knows what. But apparently they can't go east and north, you're right. I mean, we just have to take that for as a given right now. Nobody ever goes north to flee the famines. Um, so, 
Abraham knows he's going into a miserable society. And his strategy, at least in one tiny little thing, is in order to save my skin, we have to lie. Right? And then, verses 14, 15, 16, that's exactly what happens. They lie. She gets abducted. And they pay him off. And he, made, and he, and he makes a killing. He, they, well, she's a, she's, a, you know, she's a choice merchandise. She's, uh, you know, she's, she's, you know, apparently worth a lot, right? And he acquired sheep, oxen, asses, males, and also some other stuff. Because of her, it went because well, right, with Abram. So, <laughs> so um, we have in a in a little miniature little thing. We have, you know, a a, a, a kind of a picture of of all kinds of immigrants' um, lives throughout history and and uh, all over the globe. Right about people that have to sneak into lands or go into lands that are not theirs, and then, you know, they don't ask them to become the, the most upstanding citizens right away. They're going to have to uh, do whatever they need to do because guess what? Every single uh, uh, person they're going to be bumping into, they are afraid, and 99.9% .9 of the time they're right. They're they're afraid that this person will try to take advantage of them. All right, 17, verse 17, page 74. Audrey. Yep. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his household with mighty plagues on account of Sarah, Sarai, the wife of Abram. Pharaoh sent for Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her as my wife? Now here is your wife, take her and be gone. And Pharaoh put men in charge of him and they sent him off with his wife and all that he possessed. Okay, so you know, back to that question, where's God? Look at that, all of a sudden God comes into the picture but in a very funny kind of way because God doesn't talk here. Later on in the, in the, in the next story, God will talk. Here it just says that God gets credit for bringing a little plague to the uh, to the uh, to Pharaoh's household, right? Uh, uh, to prevent Pharaoh from being able to come no close to, to to Sarai, so he's afflicted in a way that that's not going to let him be comfortable physically, and uh, and he and he then there's nothing here again. So much is left out of the story. We have to make up our own, you know, you know, filling in. Um, but Pharaoh gets the message. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't get a, a, a prophecy. God doesn't talk to him. He doesn't have a dream and God uh, shows him signs and, and things. He just figures it out. Uh oh, this is unnatural. And whatever it is that uh, um, he doesn't mention God, right? He says, what is this that you have done? Why did you not tell me? Why'd you say that? Here, get out of here. So the Torah's narrator says that it's God. But Pharaoh could think that it's one of his gods or it's a bad luck or a bad whatever. This guy is a magician. This guy is a who knows what, this Abraham guy. And he's, and he's uh, outraged. Why don't you just deal straight with me? You would have, if you would have been honest with me, I never would have touched your wife. So here we have a, a, you know, a little bit of a, of a contradiction. Abraham was convinced that if he would have said this is my wife, he would have been decapitated. Pharaoh says, are you kidding? Who do you take me for? I never would have done that, shame on you. Do we believe Pharaoh? Well, how does Pharaoh know that it came because of Sarah? Because, because he can't get, because he can't, apparently get close to Sarah. It doesn't tell us what the plague is. Okay. Mighty plagues. But apparently whenever he wants to sleep with Sarah, he can't. Gotcha. I mean, that's again, I'm filling in a little bit. The Torah doesn't give you all of these. It doesn't give you every single dot to connect. You have to make leaps here. And where's, but, where's, where's Abram's faith? 
Where is Abram's faith? Right. If God already told him, I'd make you a great nation. Did, did Abram not know that that was going to come from Sarai? So that's the big problem, right? We have it again and again. We're going to have it throughout this week's, throughout Lech Lecha. Is it going to be from Hagar? And, and you have it. Right? The Hagar story later brings that up right up very, very sharply. And then later on with the Akedah. Right. You no, know, next week to give it away, right? But the Akedah. And Abram said, okay, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is not the way it's going to work out. It's going to work out some other way. How do I know? Whatever God says, that's what God's going to do. So Abraham doesn't necessarily know how it's going to play out, how the, how the, the, the covenant is going to be fulfilled. But, uh, um, you know, not knowing that long-term question doesn't take him off the hook of making short-term decisions. He's got to make the decisions now. He's got to eat. So um, going back to, to the Pharaoh question. So does this make Pharaoh into a good guy? Is, is Abraham totally wrong in his assessment? No, it's unclear. The question is of who, of who did Abraham make the right and wrong assessment? He probably made the right assessment of Pharaoh. He made the wrong assessment of God. How, say that in more clearly. He made the no, right. I mean, I, I'm not saying that. Look, Pharaoh, did yeah, Pharaoh, was saying, Pharaoh was saying that, Abraham, you're wrong about me. You were convinced. Yeah that I was going, to, was going to murder you in order to take Sarah. And I never would have done such a thing. All you had to tell me was that you are married to Sarah. And I would have said, oh, I, you know, welcome to our country, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Abraham, uh, you know, Gesundheit. hate. That's what Pharaoh claims. Pharaoh claims directly against what Abraham was convinced they would do. Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Right. So uh, had I known, I would have never never gotten into this mess. So, you know, I, 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 it's not clear. Is Pharaoh lying? Is Pharaoh simply trying to get, he knows he's dealing with a guy who has some mysterious powers, whether it's godly powers or not. He knows that he's being afflicted every time he tries to get near Sarah. So he knows that somebody else has Sarah under their control. And it's Abraham, not God. He doesn't have anything to do with God. So he says to Abraham, come on. You know, I don't want to mess with you. You're too strong for me. Had you simply said what you said. So he's trying to get out of it gracefully. Um, that would be one way to read it. The other way to read it is that Abraham's fears are wrong. Using that same, again, that same kind of paradigm the paradigm of the of the immigrant or of the of the alien. When the alien is always afraid, is the alien a paranoid or is the alien right? Well, so the answer is sometimes they're they're wrong, but a lot of times they're right. You know, we're, it, may, it may not matter. What do you mean? It may be that you're going into a situation that is so unknown and so fraught that you're not thinking, oh, maybe I'll find some nice people. But you've made a decision that you're going to see danger. So do you have the luxury in danger? Do you have that luxury to, to say, you know what, let me choose hope and niceness. Let me let me see if I can depend on the kindness of strangers. Do you have that luxury when you're in desperate situations? No, no. I mean, unless, I don't know, unless there's like a, a not-for-profit, you know, <laughs> international rescue committee is there <laughs> with their tent and the flag and whatever else they have. So, so that's a good joke that we're laughing, but that's it's not a joke. I mean, it's not. I'm serious. It's not correct. It's not a joke. What this story, this you know, this ancient story that we that we really just focus on on what they should have should have done, it really should tell us, you know, look, it's if if the if the you know the the IRC, um, you know, helps, you know, ten people or a hundred people. Guess what? There's tens of thousands. That they're not able to help. Every single one of those desperate people is is 
saying to themselves, do I make myself vulnerable or do I, do I lie and hide and, and do whatever I can to, to squeeze through so that somehow or other I can make it. Um, and and uh, it's not a great situation to be in for, as a human being. When you are dealing with danger and with evil, it's not, you have to be very, very privileged and powerful to be to get away with being a moral hero. Look, I, I could see that this type of a story exists today crossing the, the Rio Grande. Of course. Exactly. You, tell, you tell me that those immigrants aren't dealing with the exact same issues that we're seeing, whether it's the coyotes or, or, the, or the, or I don't know if they are, but I would imagine there potentially could be crooked border crossing people on Absolutely. both sides of the places. I mean, is sure. you're, you're fought with, with fear even today. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's exactly what I, what, how I'm seeing it these days. When I, you know, whatever it was, Five years ago. But it's not far away, it's here. Right, five years ago, I don't know that I would have read this story with that kind of awareness, but now I think it's inescapable. I, I think that this is really colors it for me, you know, very, very strongly. And what we have in the end is, yeah, happy ending. They're able to leave and they actually strike, you know, win the lotto. Pharaoh doesn't take away all of the food, all of the 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 uh, the, the the money that they that they gave to, to to Abraham, you know, in payment for Sarah, because actually it turns out that he seems to be a little bit afraid, seems to have a little bit of I don't want to mess with this guy, because and of course you know your question about God, I'm sort of like putting God here off on the side. The storyteller is telling us that this is God's doing. Pharaoh doesn't necessarily see it. Pharaoh just says, uh oh, there's somebody here with some really, really strong, you know, mana or whatever you want to, you know, some, some, you know, some, some really strong force that this person has. I'm not messing with this guy. And Abraham gets out of, uh, you know, gets out of the, uh, uh, of the danger. This is a biblical story. We have a midrash. From early on, you know, when, when we have, as I said, you know, the Torah itself starts out of nowhere. God speaks to Abram, get moving. And we never understand what's so special about Abraham. We don't get any previous stories. So the Midrash fills it in and ancient stories. So we have the famous story about, you know, Nimrod throwing him into the fiery furnace. But that's actually the same story. Here, it's the same idea of Abraham descends into the pit of danger and God saves him. And there Nimrod, you know, throws him into the, into the fiery furnace and God protects him. And of course, for as far as Nimrod's concerned, you know, Abraham is just some mysterious person that, that you know, magically is able to get away with things. It doesn't make Nimrod become a convert to believe in God, right? So God just has to operate every once in a while to keep things going. Let's, uh, in the, we have a time, now let's get into this Lot story, um, which follows immediately on this. And, and again, I think it, it, it fits in with this whole question about living in an evil society. So now we're chapter 13. Okay. From Egypt, Abram went up into uh, the Negev with his wife and all that he possessed together with Lot. Now, Abram was very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. And he proceeded by stages from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been, had been formerly between Bethel and Ai, the site of the altar that he had built there at first. And there Abram invoked the Lord by name. Okay, so Abraham finally can go home again. So he goes back to a place to Bethel, the house of God, that's the name, Beit El, the house of God where he had had his religious, you know, life established. He had built an altar there. And now whew, that was a close call. And, and now I can, I can, you know, be okay again. But Lot is here. Go ahead. Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support, could not support them staying together for their possessions were so great that they could not remain together. And there was quarreling between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and those of Lot's cattle. The Canaanites and Perizzites were there, were then dwelling in the land. Abram said to Lot, 
let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and yours, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Let us separate. If you go north, I will go south. If you go south, I will go north. Lot looked about him and saw how well watered was the whole plain of the Jordan, all of it. This was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, all the way to Zor, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Uh, yeah? Well, there's Egypt again. Go ahead. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, eastward. Thus they parted from each other. Abram remained in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the plain, pitching his tent near Sodom. Now the inhabitants of Sodom, sorry, Sodom, were very wicked sinners against the Lord. Okay, the that's, plan, that's enough, that's enough. So, so here we have this um, aftermath of the, of the Egypt episode, at least that's the way it's told. It comes right after that episode. And the happy ending and living in peace and quiet that Abraham would seem to have uh, uh, expected and that the reader thinks would, would follow doesn't work out that way. Only this time, the problem isn't from the outside. It's not from some wicked people that are harassing uh, um, uh, Abraham or, or intimidating him. This is his own nephew. This is the, his own nephew is so successful and his you know, uh, employees, his, his shepherds are not getting along with Abraham's employees. And Abraham says, I can't take it, right? Verse eight, let there not be strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and yours, we're kinsmen. So go your way and I'll go my way. So first of all, we should really just feel how sad that is for Abraham and for Lot. They've been together all this time. Remember, Lot has grown up in Abraham's house and Lot took the chance of going with Abraham and Sarah from Ur Kazdim, from Haran, hundreds of miles trekking through this weird uh, uh, you know, mission to go find some unknown place that Abraham said that he heard God tell him to go to. Lot has been with him the whole time. I mean, it's, uh, so, so now for Abraham to say, now we're not getting along, we have to go, we have to split up. It's a very, very sad, um, you know, development. Where on the one hand, hey, we're family, so let's not fight. But the only way that we're not going to be able to fight is if we don't have anything to do with each other. That's pretty sad. So Lot, he says, you have, Abraham says to Lot, you have your first choice. Take whatever you want. Go wherever you want, and I'll separate the other way. Take first choice. What do you prefer? And then we get this panoramic, uh, 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 you know, shot from through the eyes of Lot. Lot looks around and he sees how well watered was the whole plain. Of course, this is before the destruction, all the way like a garden of the Lord, right? Just like the land of Egypt. And that's where I said, whoa, we should all say, whoa, we just got out of Egypt. We just got out of Egypt by, by, by the skin of our teeth. We just escaped Egypt. Um, you know, because, because we were, God somehow intervened to save our lives. But all Lot says is, look, they don't have famine in this place. The Jordan River makes it so, so verdant and so fertile. Apparently, you know, he's seeing, you know, whether correctly or not, this is the best place to go to. And he makes no uh, um, qualification about what is the culture there? What's the civilization? What are the people like there? The narrator tells us what the people are like, but Sodom is a very wicked place. Sodom is a very wicked place and Lot decides that's where I'm going. So 
we have, a, you know, a, again, a choice. Before we had this mysterious choice, Abraham has to choose to go down to Egypt, but the Torah kind of tries to explain he really didn't want to go down to Egypt. He had to go down to Egypt and he had to co compromise himself and, and, uh, and in a certain sense, betray himself and his wife. And now Lot has to make a choice, but his choice is from something else. His choice is because he wants more because he and his uh, employees, his shepherds, they wanna be rich and they wanna have a lot of land and they wanna be able to have more and more flocks and they wanna have, uh, you know, they wanna, they wanna expand. And, and uh, so what do they decide to do? We've got a great place to open up a market. Let's go to that totalitarian country over there where they treat everybody like dirt and we'll be able to go there and we'll be very successful. That's the decision that Lot makes. Um, There's no indication that Lot or Abram knew of how evil it was there, is there? We don't have an indication until chapter... Until it's too late, and, until it's too late, until he's already there and he gets... Well, so, but that's not, that's, that's not, you know, two generations later, that's not the, uh, you know, that's, that's soon enough. Right. What, what the, what the, I think what the, what the narrator is telling us is that this was, this was an, a given. This was, this was something that was, people knew if they wanted to know. How about let's make it that way. Lot doesn't want to know. You know, we don't have to say, we don't have to say that Lot is choosing evil per se. But Lot is saying, you know what? And this goes back to the question again. Maybe Lot is saying to himself, hey, I'm Abraham's nephew. I've grown up in a good house. You know, I, I'll, I'll be okay. And I'll be able to negotiate the system. And the fact that everybody else uh, is, is completely morally corrupt, that's not gonna, it's not gonna bother me because I'm not gonna participate in that. I, I know I have enough resources here. I'll be able to do well. Um, I'll treat people fairly. And that'll be fine. So um, you know, we could say that that's that's his that's his uh, uh, intention. And in fact, of course, later on when we get to the Lot and Sodom story, you know, he sounds like he's a you know a fairly decent guy. You know, he he goes out. Nobody else is willing to welcome these three strangers. Right. You know, we talked about that whole mixed story also. So yeah, Lot is a complicated guy, but exactly that's the point. He illustrates those complications. You know, what choices do we have? What choices do we have here in the United States? If we don't want to um, deny, you know, we've got, you know, the 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 people. Let's say like like Mike Pence. Mike Pence denies that there is any systemic problem in American society. There's no systemic racism. There's no systemic problem in the police uh, uh, law enforcement system. There's no systemic problem in, 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 in the economic system. There's no systemic problem you know, in terms of jobs or real estate or education. Or he says, no, it's not. You know, Maybe there's a bad person here and there, but there's no real, real societal problem. So if any of us would disagree with him, we're actually in a big problem because we're part of that society. We are part of that system. So, but each and every one of us tries to be as good as we can be. That's why I say this is the problem of living. How do you live as a decent person in a, a corrupt, compromised society? How but I'm not seeing that in these two instances, Abram or Lot, are actually trying all that hard. They well, are, but, their behavior is understandable, but it's not like Noah. Well, that's why I wanted to contrast the Abraham story and, and, and apply it, like Alan said, apply it to migrants, to refugees, where they don't have a choice. He, his choice is let me stay put and die of starvation, or let me go into Egypt. That's how he sees his choice. You know, look, that's what Trump says about all these people that are trying to get into the country. Why don't they stay where they are? What's wrong with them? 
Why don't they go? Why don't they just make their country better? And the answer is because the gang is gonna is gonna murder me any second unless I get out of here. I don't. I would love to stay here, but I don't have a choice. That's what I'm trying to make the distinction between the Abraham story in Egypt and the Lot story. Well, the Abraham choice, story though. is 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 getting into trouble because you don't have a choice. And the load story is maybe with your eyes closed, but nevertheless making a choice to go into a situation of compromise. Yeah, Alan. No, I was going to say that Lord had a choice. I mean, he, he was given the choice of which way to go. And that was, right. you know, that was, that was his choice. Let's play, let's play a, 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 a what if. What if Lot would have gone the other way? Would Abraham have gone to Sodom? Or would he have just stayed where he was? Because he, 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 even if you stay where you are, you're, you're separated from the other guy. Right, right. Because in this instance, in fact, Abraham didn't go the other way. Abraham stayed where he was. Right. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's the, that's the assumption that we have to make. Abraham chooses makes difficult choices. Sometimes, you know, we can question those choices, but he's making choices um, as best as he can. And when he can't make a choice is when it gets to be really sticky. With Lot, Lot is making an unforced choice. Um, he's making a choice that, that he didn't have to make. He could have made a different calculation and he didn't. Now, of course, we, so, you know, back when I say, what about us, we're implicated in this, in this society. Here we are, we're here, we're born here, we work here. We, it's not like we, we, we're moving in to this. Um, but that is also a question. You know, we also, we do adopt certain choices. We do move into certain things. We do, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, choose um, where we go, what we do and so on to a certain extent. And that's the big question. That's the big question, and it's and it's exhausting. It's exhausting uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, keep always thinking about that, when uh, you know when when the forces that are the other way are so overwhelming. Um, in the end, of course, Lot is a, is a little bit of a tragic figure. You know, he he will lose his his uh, his gamble. He's gambling that he can live in Sodom and be okay and be a good man. And in the end, of course, not only is Sodom destroyed, but he loses uh, half his family. You know, he himself becomes a refugee also. So, uh, um, you know, it's terrible. So it's, it's an ends up becoming a pretty terrible story. You're talking about the, the load as a, as a biblical character. I, 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 I you know, the, 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 the fact that they had to separate because their employees couldn't get along is, you know, it, it seems somewhat contrived. I don't know if the right word is contrived or whatever, but did load, you know, somebody, you know, if your employees, employees are not doing well, then you you should be able to right, the buck should discipline stop, at some the point. The buck should yeah. stop at your play, at your desk. Why? Um, why, why unless, why there was a, unless there was a planned mutiny that load wanted to, to match well, I, I think your question is even stronger. Abraham, why isn't Abraham intervening with his shepherds? Right. It says that there's that they that his shepherds and load shepherds aren't getting along, that they're having conflict. So good. Why doesn't Abraham go in there and make peace and put his foot down and say, cut it out here? But it also that. says that they're not getting along. No. Well, he says, I don't want to have a fight with you. Yeah. If you look at look at again, look at eight. Yeah. Look well, look at six and seven. You got it? So the land could not support them staying together. Oh, they ran out of space. Yeah. For their possessions. Keep going. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, for their possessions were so great that they could not remain together. And there was quarreling between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and those of Lot's cattle. The Canaanites... Let's skip all that part and then go to eight. Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and yours, for we are kinsmen. 
Okay. Um, if you look at the note, do you have the Eitz Chaim? Yes. So look at the note uh, where it says, uh, for, for note seven, for pe verse seven. Between the herdsmen? Yeah. That one and the next comment. Okay. Uh, Abram acts quickly while the discord is still in its early stage and before it can embitter relationships among those involved. So they're trying to make nice. They're trying to say, oh, Abraham is actually being proactive. Mm -hmm. He's also being realistic, right? Back to, back to our question. Well, why don't they just make peace and get along? So that's the editorial comment. There's just not enough for these two guys to get along. They're, they're too big, right? They're, they're, they're too, they have succeeded. This is the curse of their success. Okay, and you know, to a certain extent, it goes back to Egypt. Abraham's success is rooted to a certain degree in all those gifts that he got from Pharaoh. Okay, now the Canaanites. Apparently the natural resources would have been sufficient for two small pastoral nomadic clans. The area, however, already had a settled agricultural urban community, which explains why both Abram and Lot had to leave the region. Right. So this is what happens with gentrification. It used to be in the old days that everybody could have their own little uh, homestead and their own little thing. But now, you know, there's too much success and the price of success is that we all can't stay here together. So these are the questions that the Torah, you know, opens up. It doesn't give us, you know, definitive answers and that's where we're going to stop. All right, Yeshikoach. Hopefully see each other next time. Yes. Thank you very much. See you Bye. in a half an hour. All right, I got to stop the recording. Stop the recording. Stop it. Okay, Zagazin.